and welcome to the webinar series of the ITU Journal on Future in Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. Alessia, we cannot see you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I repeat again, hello and welcome to the webinar series of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. ITU allocates frequencies to the, U, to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU Journal, which offers complete coverage of communication and networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this webinar series launched in March this year will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open today the webinar with Professor Edward Knightley from Rice University, USA. And we count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. So please submit your questions uh, via the Q&A channel. We will address uh, your questions to the speaker during the Q&A session. And after the talk and the Q&A, please stay online we, uh, for the Wisdom Corner live life lessons. Professor Knightley will guide young scholars in the field of current ICT research. Now I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the moderator of this webinar, Professor Ian Akilditz, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and Founder and President of Truva from the United States. Uh, Professor Akilditz uh, is Ken Bayer Chair Professor in Telecommunication Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technologies. In the last decades, uh, he established many research centers worldwide, including in Finland, in Spain, in Africa, and Saudi Arabia. He's uh, editor in chief emeritus of Impact Factor Journals and at uh, the top of the most prestigious international rankings. He's visiting distinguished professors in many universities around the world. He's also author of many patents, including the last one received on Cube Satellite. So congratulations, Ian. And his current research interests include 6G, 7G wireless communication systems, hologram communication, terahertz molecular mo uh, communication, intelligent surfaces, nano networks, and many other subjects. So Ian, the floor is yours for your opening remarks and to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Alessia, and uh, I hope uh, I'm on, and I would like to welcome you again to our ITU Journal for Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all around the world. I have a great pleasure to introduce you one of the greatest researchers of his generation, Dr. Edmund Knightley, as our distinguished speaker today. Before I present you Edward's career, I want to share my personal experience with him. I met him almost 30 years ago when he was still a PhD student with my dear friend, uh, Professor Domenico Ferrari at the University of Berkeley. I personally liked him and also I was very impressed by his research. That time, it's also a good test for my memory. I'm sure he will like it. He was working on scheduling algorithms for wired networks. He published many pioneering research papers that time and many, many more afterwards on very interesting hot topics in communications and networking field. Edward received his master's and PhD degrees from UC Berkeley uh, in 1992 and 1996 respectively. He has, he has BS degrees from Auburn University in Alabama in 1991. Edward joined Ryan's University, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in 1996. Edward went through all ranks and served the Department of EC as the chair for five years. And also he became a chair professor at Rice. And I have to also say, that's my promotional second. I take enormous pride that I supported Edward through his entire career. 
And uh, we had many, many uh, uh, personal interactions at conferences, and I visited him many times. He came to Georgia Tech many times. So it was always fun to be with Edward. His research evolves around networking, mobile wireless systems, and also latent security. His uh, research focuses more on protocol design, performance modeling, and evaluation, and also he has some uh, experimental test beds like uh, the one that I will mention about urban scale, uh, like wireless mesh network. Edward and his group were the first to create a multi-user beam forming wireless LAN system. And they demonstrated the multi-user MIMO in the wireless networking standard in IEEE 802.11 AC. Edward is an excellent speaker and does. He's well sought and invited keynote speaker for many leading conferences even I invited him uh, in uh, many conferences as keynote speaker. He always delivers uh, an excellent uh, keynote. Uh, Edward received many awards, not easy to list all of them, and some of them are, are for example, he is a Sloan Fellow back in 2001, an IEEE Fellow 2009, and ACM Fellow in 2017. He uh, chaired many, many conferences, really leading conferences, not like all you can eat conferences. They are really uh, prestigious conferences and he did an excellent job. In 2007, I visited him at Rice University. I, that's why I remember it very well because he showed me his uh, wireless mesh networks test bed. And this was an excellent community service because he was providing internet uh, service to uh, poor communities in Houston. So that was, that was really impressive. That's why I still remember it. And also in 2016, a video of Knightley's work was featured during the White House's announcement of a new 400 million wireless initiative. And the, lately, uh, the last four, five, six years, he had some pioneering results for terahertz communication networks. And his Google Scholar H index is 98 and total number of citations is 46,632 and I'm sure it's increasing uh, rapidly. And again, uh, we thank you, Edward, for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Ian, so much. It was for that uh, introduction, but also to, to get to relive some of those uh, wonderful times we had previously at uh, and, and it, it really, I, I do appreciate so much. It goes back to, to student days too. Um, and, and that's back in the nineties. Uh, I don't know if all the, the, the years were, were in, in the bio, but uh, it was, it's been a pleasure to know you since the nineties. And, and also I thank you for your support through the nineties and, and, uh, and all those invitations for keynotes and so on to um, just really, really uh, impactful. So thank you. Um, and also thank you for inviting me today. Um, so uh, maybe I'll see if I can share uh, my my screen. <clears throat> so so uh, and also I'd like to to welcome our our online audience and I look forward to uh, Q and A afterwards and and. You can put them in the chat or, or audio. I'm not sure how, how we'll do it at the end, but I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, but so uh, today I'd like to talk about some of our recent work, uh, starting with millimeter wave and 60 gigahertz, uh, maybe um, 10 years ago or so, and, and moving up to terahertz uh, in, in, in more recent uh, years. And so I'd like to talk about the three aspects of that, wireless networking, sensing, and security and uh, targeting higher frequencies. So whether it's 60 gigahertz or, or 100, I'll, I'll, I think my title is 100, but I'll actually start with today's standard uh, at, at 60. So I, I, I changed my title slightly for 60. Um, but I'd like to begin with, what are some of the things that we're trying to do in next generation wireless? And we, we, uh, we have data rate challenges of how do we get to terabits per second while having mobility, low latency, robust, secure from eavesdroppers and attackers, um, but also the fusion of sensing uh, and communications. 
And uh, I'd like to show you the, the, the points to the picture on the lower left. This is, you can tell it's pre-COVID because everybody was sitting so close together. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a VR uh, conference. And I want you to notice that everyone has a wire uh, coming from their uh, headset. And so if we think about trying to make wireless work at those sorts of not just data rates, but densities, gigabits per second per square meters, um, that, that we're not yet there today. And so we have farther to go with all of these metrics to support the new applications. And whether it's, it's uh, VR, AR, or UAV networks, or something we haven't foreseen yet, the new uh, capabilities that we introduce for networking security and, and sensing can help foster development of those new applications. So I'd like to turn to uh, an issue is the, the issue of spectrum and what are some of the, why, why should we be looking at, up at higher frequencies, millimeter wave and, and sub terahertz and, and, and what are the trade-offs that we have? And so just to remind you of the Fries equation um, shown there on the right, uh, we can see that the uh, received power has in the denominator, this frequency squared term. And so the other terms are the, the transmit gains of the antennas and speed of light uh, and the distance. But I just want to focus on the frequency for a moment and, and just ask ourselves, well, what, how much do we lose? What's that D squared doing to us at, at 10 meters, just to get it in perspective? And so earlier in my career, I worked in UHF TV bands, and those were wonderful for Wi-Fi. We called it super Wi-Fi at the time. And um, and so that, that gives us a baseline of losing 46 dB at 10 meters. And then as we go up uh, in order of magnitude and spectrum to today's Wi-Fi around 5 gigahertz, then, um, then we're, we're losing you know, not just the factor of 10, but the factor of 10 squared. And so that's where you know, these, uh, these 20 dB differences come. And then we go up to millimeter wave, and now we've lost about another 20 dB and beyond. So these, these, you know, losing a few dB here and there might not be such a big problem, but in the end, we've, we've lost uh, uh, quite a bit of, of gain as we, as we go up to higher frequencies. So it's important to keep in mind, you know, what sort of orders of magnitude are, are we discussing when, when we talk about those uh, link losses, uh, just purely due to free, free space uh, path loss. Um, but now what about data rate? So data rate, according to Shannon, We've got this uh, uh, bandwidth term up front with the W. So if the capacity is, is um, proportional to our bandwidth. Um, and then we've got the log uh, one plus SNR term uh, after that. But the bandwidths too are just astounding when we think about what are the orders of magnitude uh, of the bandwidths available. And again, I'll start with the UHF channels and we, so, you know, a TV channel is five megahertz at most. They, they even subslice them to be less than that. So five megahertz channel, um, it's quite narrow for Wi-Fi and, and very challenging to get high data rates um, with such a narrow channel. The Wi-Fi we're all using right now probably is, is um, 802.11ax and five gigahertz. And there our basic channel is 20 megahertz, but we can bond it up to 160. Um, so we're, we're getting an order of magnitude uh, over the UHF. Uh, bands. And then in 60 gigahertz, two, two gigahertz channels now. Um, so just, you know, keep gaining orders of magnitude in bandwidth. It just is really important to wrap, wrap or, or, our minds around, you know, what the scale here is. And then if we start even going higher, 100 gigahertz up to terahertz, you know, could we even be talking about tens of gigahertz or even 100 gigahertz scale uh, channels, which would just give us astounding uh, capacity. And now the, the last aspect of spectrum I wanted to point you to is, is the sensing resolution. And there are lots of different sensing technologies. I'll talk about some of them today, but ultimately there's always a lambda in there somewhere limiting resolution, the wavelength. And so just to remind you what those wavelengths are, then we started at meter scale with TV bands. You know, now at Wi-Fi, we're at um, um, centimeter scale. Uh, millimeter wave, 60 gigahertz, five millimeters. And then as we get up to 300 gigahertz, exactly uh, a millimeter. 
And so as, as we get to uh, higher frequencies and lower wavelengths, and we can expect that we will get better and better sensing resolution. So the question, could we have it all if we start going above 60 gigahertz, above 100 gigahertz, can we, can we get the wide bandwidth, high resolution sensing? Can we use those GTGR terms that I, that I didn't mention much up front, but just said those are gains. So if we can get good antenna gains and potentially we can get some of that, uh, those losses uh, due to path loss uh, back, and and is is that is that all it's about? We just need to crank up the gains and and uh, and then we're done and use all the things we've done in the past. And so that's where I'd like to start today is is to say, well, what are the challenges if we wanted to use this very wide spectrum, get the great sensing resolution? Uh, is it just a matter of put some more gain out front uh, and we're done? So I'd like to talk about what, what what makes things hard and what are some of the research challenges? What are some of the things we've done? What's what's still open? Um, so uh, the road ahead to uh, you know, high resolution sensing and, and mobile and terabits per second, and I want to talk about two kind of cautionary things too about how the control plane works and how we set everything up, and then also I'll talk about uh, security uh, as well. And so maybe to start, um, it's useful to ask the question, uh, how does a Wi-Fi work today at um, 60 gigahertz? And, and this gives us a, uh, a building block for, uh, for understanding uh, how commercial systems can work. Uh, what, are, what are the challenges? What, how does Wi-Fi at 60 gigahertz differ really fundamentally from, from all the other versions, uh, sub six? And so there's a, there's a paper here um, we wrote a few years ago with two of the leaders uh, from Intel, uh, Claudio De Silva and Carlos Cordero. My student and I uh, co-authored this paper with them about uh, some of the features of Wi-Fi at 60. So maybe just to review this, and so uh, this uh, briefly, how, how it works at 60. So um, the, the, the physical device is, is an antenna array and it uses um, analog beam forming, which I'm showing here with, um, with variable weights. So, so variables um, steering phases in order to, to be able to steer the beams. And um, those weights are typically uh, discretized and come from a, a, a set of fixed weights. And then together those sets are called sectors. So you can, you can think of a sector as, as a, as a nice cone pointing in a particular direction as I'm illustrating there. In reality, I'll show you a picture of one and they're a little bit uh, messier. Um, but nonetheless, you can think of um, because the weights allow up to 128 sectors, you could potentially be as, as, as narrow as three degrees beam width. And the standard provides the mechanisms to how do you adapt the sectors? How do you steer, steer the beams, which is um, uh, a new for 60 gigahertz um, for, for uh, phased array um, uh, beam steering. And then that was a 211 AD and then AY also added MIMO capability. So, um, so the, the steering alone isn't, isn't MIMO, it's just phased array, but then as we have multiple RF chains, um, then we have the possibility for multiple streams and MIMO and that was introduced in 11 AY. So the picture on the right showing you know, two RF chains of baseband and each of those uh, independently steerable. That's an example of the, the capability that would be uh, uh, realized in, in the 802.11ay uh, access point. Uh, a client typically would not have uh, MIMO on it. Um, so now, uh, beam training. How does beam? So now we've got to align these highly directional beams to get those transmit and receive gains that I mentioned in the earlier slide. So how does that work in a standard? Um, so the standard used a term called a sector level sweep, which is a very kind of in, in, intuitive way of, of testing all the directions. So we'll, we'll have just the, the this relatively simple view of, of a sector just being a, a, a directive uh, a slice of the area around a transmitter. And so the AP here tests all directions. And, um, and the receiver's listening in what's called quasi-omnidirectional. So I drew a circle around the receiver here to say, listen in all directions. So uh, the receiver identifies the, the best one, which in this case, the, the darkest green one. Um, and then 
the process repeats in the other uh, on the other side. So now the, the the client does its sector sweep, and the access point is in, in pseudo omni or quasi omni, and um, and this process works. They they find the both they both find the um, uh, the the best possible beam that in this case the two two greens. So so it's it's a successful. Um, way of, of finding the best beam pair. Um, so this, this is successful until there's some misalignment. So here, if we think about, let's suppose the client rotates. Um, if the client rotates, then actually the AP is still fine and it's just the client that needs to re-steer. But if there's a translation, as I'm showing, then both the client and the access point need to re-steer. And so we've got to do it again. So um, and the other possibility is a blockage. So maybe they steer towards each other, and then now there's um, now there's a person or some other object blocking it in the middle. So they need to find a a, a specular reflection off of the surface and create a non line of sight link. So the standard does all of these things. And um, so what could possibly be wrong if the standard's able to already find the best uh, beam pairs and it can already adapt to blockage and and uh, and mobility then then aren't, aren't we just done here and um and the issue is is this the control plane overhead and i want to give you a time scale here i'm not being specific with you know how many micro milliseconds everything's taking but this uh the, the drawing is gives you a relative scale about how long does it take to do the sector sweeps for the transmitter and receiver versus how long does it take to transmit data? And so you can see from the timeline below that actually the setup time far exceeds the uh, uh, frame transmission time. And so that means there's in essence an outage that there could there's time where there could be transmitting data, but instead um, it's, uh, uh, it's setting up and aligning links. Now you might ask, well, these standard guys just, they, they're not, you know they need to get smarter, and what what do they do wrong? And if you, and if you think about well, why does it take so long? Each of these sectors has to be labeled. So if the receiver wants to say, "I my favorite sector is green," there needs to be some numbering on that, and or some label, and it needs to know who's doing a sector sweep. So who who's doing it? Which number is it? And then that way, they it can feed it back. So what does labeling sound like? It sounds like a header. Right, so if you have a header and it, it's in essence a, a a a short frame, and so the overhead is solely due to sending a physical layer preambles and and all those um, uh, uh, packet headers or frame headers uh, one at a time up to 128. Of them. So it takes a while to send 128 um, uh, different uh, frames, even even if they're, they're short frames. Uh, and this is getting worse. So I told you I would show you a real beam uh, from 60 gigahertz, and that's one there on the left. Uh, and so, um, but there's one on the right from uh, 300 gigahertz beam. And so you can see on the left, you've got this kind of blob that you, you can steer it around and the directivity is changing. Uh, but as we get to higher and higher frequencies, the directivity, the directionality is getting higher and higher. So what does that mean? The search space grows. So if, if, if you look at the beam on the left, you might think, oh, maybe we can have 10 or 20 of those and, and select. But if you look at the one on the right, you, you'd probably think, boy, we need hundreds of those to, to, to get the best one. Um, so, uh, so we're getting more possibilities. The search space is growing. And, um, and every time we re retrain, we have this outage that I mentioned. And what that means is um, the throughput ends up being far less than the physical layer rate. That the physical layer rate, we might have data rates uh, in gigabit per second scale, uh, hundreds of gigabits even. Yet, if we have outages, um, then those start to really hinder what the ultimate throughput is. So the question is, can we can we rapidly re-steer the beams? So I'd like to um, talk about an, a a new device above 100 gigahertz uh, called leaky wave antenna and uh, a leaky wave antenna I'll, as, as i'll describe it and as i'll use it in our experiments as well 
um, is uh, simple parallel plates that that um, uh, that maybe you, you use in, in physics class for learning about waveguides and how waves propagate through uh, through uh, metal uh, <clears throat> between metal plates. And um, and the interesting thing about a leaky wave antenna is that it's got this opening in the slot. Uh, so that's a slot shown on the on the lower left. And what uh, the leaky wave antenna uh, does, as the name suggests, is that the 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 um, the waveguide doesn't uh, let the wave go uh, straight through from left to right, but but instead it leaks out of the slot, and it leaks out with an angle that is related to the frequency. And so um, this is angular dispersion, in which case the, the higher input frequencies uh, emit at a lower angle. Um, so according to the equation on the right, where C is speed of light, B is the, um, the, the distance between the two parallel plates, and F is the frequency. So the key number there is the frequency F determines the steering angle. Uh, now I put new device in quotes because leaky wave antennas are, are really not that new. They've been around since uh, there's the patent application you can see 1940 uh, and the patent itself uh, highlighted the same feature that, that I uh, suggested um, previously. So they've been around a long time, but what, uh, what really is new about them is that as we get wider bandwidths, we get a much bigger range of Fs that we can put in that denominator. And with that bigger range, we can have uh, better uh, control over the angle. <clears throat> so for example, we can use this property of angular dispersion to steer the beam that, um, that by changing the F in the denominator of that equation, we change um, the, the angle that it steers and depending on, on B, then uh, we can steer across a whole, uh, almost a 90 degree range, 10 to 80 degrees um, by changing the frequency. So in this case, changing it between about 150 gigahertz and, and, uh, and 800 gigahertz. And so this has yielded the highest frequency beam steering mechanism demonstrated to date because it gets more and more challenging to steer using traditional methods like uh, phase arrays at higher frequencies above say 400 gigahertz. Um, and it should be noted, this is this is one antenna. There's a, it's a single leaky wave antenna. There's no phase array, there's no MIMO, and we have terahertz scale uh, beam steering. Yet the question still remains where to steer? Where is the client? How do we know <clears throat> um, which direction to steer to? Which, 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 which is the best angle for the client? And this is one of our, our, our works um, recently uh, and we call it a terahertz rainbow. And the idea is to excite the leaky wave antenna with a broadband pulse, i.e. we put all frequencies in. And so if we put all frequencies in, then the leaky wave antenna separates those frequencies according to the angle. So just analogous to, the, to a rainbow, the lowest frequencies would be closest to broadside and the highest frequencies would be closest to parallel. Now, what this, does is it enables the uh, uh, instantaneous direction finding. Because remember, the whole problem with the sector sweep is you had to label each angle, say this is this is sector one, this is sector two, and so on. And now here we have an inherent labeling of the frequency that if, if showing here in the picture, the receiver is, is located at yellow. So therefore, the um, uh, with the single pulse, and then the receiver is now localized with respect to the transmitter uh, uh, for the angle. Um, so with with, uh, with one shot, so this gives us, with the terahertz rainbow, we have one shot location discovery. And so with a single a pulse, uh, sub nanosecond scale, now all receivers, I'm showing one here, know their relative angle. So it, the, 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 uh, the method is remarkable for, the, uh, the, for the things it doesn't need. It doesn't need the trial and error testing. It doesn't need phase information. It's a non-coherent uh, method and therefore all the, uh, the, the setup required to, uh, to require um, coherent communication, signal processing and so on are not needed. Uh, there's no array signal processing. So it's a very uh, simple method to fast and simple. 
Um, so just to give you, I want to show you how well it worked in the lab. So um, the um, uh, so far I've been showing you the, the, the equation for the peak emission angle on the left, but actually it's not just one narrow band frequency, but it emits uh, uh, over a range of frequencies. And so you can characterize what that range is. So there's some, there's some analytical models um, that uh, characterize how the electromagnetic wave uh, or radiates as, as a function of the, the um, slot width, the, the plate, the difference, uh, distance between the plates and, and all of those parameters. And then you get more of a spectrum um, uh, shown on, uh, on the left or on the right, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and then, so we did an implementation in practice with uh, in, our, in our lab with parallel plates. And what we ended up doing, the theory on the left uh, is on the left and, and the uh, uh, measurements on the right. So what we ended up doing is creating a signature for, for each angle. So let me see if I can get my, um, my pointer going. Um, so the way to think of this is that if the receiver say here is at 30 degrees, then what they'll see is not only the spectral peak around 300 gigahertz, but they'll also see um, uh, a fading off um, uh, as it goes down here, but they'll, there'll also be a higher uh, mode um, uh, from uh, the second mode uh, 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 TE uh, wave. And so you can see the, the original model here was um, TE1, but here we'll see two, three, and four modes. And each angle then can have a signature. So we can in one shot get the signature based on the uh, the experimental characterization of the antenna. Um, the theory just using the model alone works quite well too, but we can refine that to get an even better match. So just show some results from the lab. How well can we do angle of arrival in one shot? Um, and so showing here measured angle on the x-axis and the estimated angle on the y-axis. And you can see um, with, within the, um, the, the core, of the 20 to 60 range, we've got extremely low errors and then it starts to tail off on the two edges. And if you wonder why is it tailing off, you can start to see, well, here we've got a lot of smearing out of, of the signatures. Uh, and then here the signatures are quite sharp. So in the sweet spot of the range, we're able to do uh, highly accurate. And of course we need to steer over more than uh, uh, 70 degrees as shown. So we would have to have multiple of these in, um, to, to get a full 360 coverage in any case. Um, so um, that result that was uh, with a, a former PhD student of mine, uh, Yasmin Gossipour, she's now at, um, at Princeton. And it appeared uh, in, oh, there was a version of it in Mobicom and then also one in Nature Communications. Um, and so I'd like to turn a little bit to sensing and, um, and radar. And uh, the basic idea of radar is, is to send out a, um, uh, a radio signal and look for, um, for the received reflections and to use that in order to uh, localize devices. So it's, a, it's still a localization problem, but it's, it's different in the sense that prior we had a transmitter and a receiver who are helping us uh, align. And here we, we have a transmitter that's uh, also acting as a receiver of its own um, uh, localization transmissions. Um, so this, um, I'll just show you one, one result on this, which um, really impressed me. This is from uh, the Middleman lab at Brown University. And so um, his idea was to use the same terahertz rainbow uh, method for radar. And so it's the same thing. If you send out a high broadband pulse through a leaky wave antenna, then a rainbow emits. And now the, re the reflection is gonna come from a certain angle. So the reflection will, will come back at a certain frequency, i.e. a certain color. So that would say, oh, if I see something reflected at red, then it's close to broadside and you know, violet you know, closer to parallel. And so the same principle. And, um, and so the experiment I'm showing here is to take a, a, a small uh, metal rod uh, with 10 millimeter radius and move it along a triangle. So a triangle shown in, in, in blue. So blue is the ground truth. And then um, 
and then he's shooting uh, uh, terahertz rainbows at the rod and then estimating where it is and the estimate is, is in the red. And to me, the astounding thing is when you just look at the scale of this, that's, that's millimeters uh, on the X and, and Y axis. And so we've got millimeter scale uh, accuracy um, or angular resolution of about a degree. And again, the, the, the thing that's amazing is all the things that this solution doesn't have. There is no array processing, right? So you, know, you think about high resolution sensing that you're seeing in a lot of the uh, research community's papers. And, and I mean, eight antennas is kind of a starting point and you'd really love to have massive MIMO to get good resolution. And this, this is a single antenna. There's, there's one, one leaky wave uh, antenna. So truly astounding resolution um, that we can realize um, by using this property of angular dispersion. Um, an, another work, um, uh, this work is by Kaushik Sengupta from Princeton. And so he um, took the idea and, uh, and built a CMOS circuit. And we in our lab, we were using um, a time domain system that was spanning 100 gigahertz to terahertz. So that's quite a wide bandwidth to, uh, uh, to use. And so he not only did a circuit realization, but also brought in a more practical constraint that, well, let's not assume we have 900 gigahertz available to do a localization. And so he squeezed the, the, the uh, bandwidth required down to uh, uh, 40 gigahertz built it in CMOS and demonstrated um, 3D localization using the same principle. So I was also quite uh, impressed with that result. So um, the, the sensing and communication takeaway, and, and then I'll turn to uh, security for the remainder of the talk, but the sensing and security takeaway is that the way it's being done right now at 60 gigahertz are uh, uh, phased arrays, uh, as, as the main solution uh, for uh, steering and getting that transmit receive gain that we talked about early, how important that is. Uh, unique ID for each beam, trial and error testing, um, microsecond scale uh, uh, process. And um, if you wanna do localization, you can either use the trial and error or you can do array processing. Uh, and then so with, with a new device that has angular dispersion, there's other ways to get angular dispersion from uh, devices too, but this is, this is a uh, exemplary one. And so it's devices now, now physics uh, properties that, um, that really haven't impacted us as researchers at lower frequencies for angular dispersion. It, it, it exists in other, it exists in a phase array, uh, but, it, but the, the, um, uh, the, uh, impact is so minor that we can't really make good use of it for things like localization. So it's something we typically ignore. So we can, if you're sub six gigahertz, you probably went your whole career and never said the word angular, uh, words angular dispersion before. Um, so it's single antenna and, and a spectral signature at each angle, get all directions at once, nanosecond scale, and then now we can do radar with uh, high resolution and, and fast. Okay, so I'd like to turn to security and ask about um, security capabilities and threats as we go above uh, 60 and above 100 gigahertz millimeter wave in a sub terahertz. And so I'll, I'll just start with a, with a one or two slide uh, review of what, what it is we're trying to do with security. And there are many things uh, for example, like denial of service availability, and, and I won't be talking about those. I'll, I'll only be talking about the confidentiality goal. And that goal is we've got an eavesdropper in somewhere in the network. And um, the, the, the goal of confidentiality is that if the eavesdropper intercepts the message, um, then the bits will appear to be random. So Eve can no longer uh, intercept uh, can no longer interpret the bits that she um, she uh, intercepts, and only Bob can decode the message. And we assume that Bob has the, the secret key. So in this scenario, I've got Alice's servers, uh, Bob is the receivers, and Eve is sitting there wirelessly uh, next to Bob somewhere uh, within radio range. Uh, in the internet, we have multi-layer security. 
So there's um, secure sockets layer, IPsec, um, Wi-Fi has uh, encryption as well. So there's layer upon layer uh, of encryption that I won't review today. Um, but I would like to ask the question about why is there multi-layer? Um, and um, the uh, this 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 cartoon that uh, uh, one of my collaborators uh, made for me uh, illustrates with the house. And so we don't just put one lock on a house, but we might also have a security camera. Uh, we might have a, a front gate, could have a keypad, uh, could have a bucket of boiling water. Uh, we can have all sorts of different layers in case one is breached, right? That's the point of multiple layers is that one could get breached. And so we, we want a backup system for other ones. But why go to the physical layer? Why is this just a fourth layer? And then are we really saying three will be broken? We need a fourth. But, to, but from my point of view, the wireless broadcast is the most vulnerable component. This is where the signals are going over the air. And that gives Eve an excellent opportunity to intercept them you know, versus on a fiber where it's extremely difficult for Eve to even have access to the bits in order to attack. Um, so at physical layer security, the goal is that Eve can't intercept the bits at all. And it's a real new foundational layer of security. So back to our analogy, the reason I like this analogy is in, in, the, in the one on the left, we've got many, many layers, but the attacker there is, has the ability to, to try to pick all those locks, right? That's the attacker has all those locks in front of them and says, let me throw whatever I can at this. Maybe I'll throw quantum computing at it. Right, and then now, if, if we succeed with physical layer security, then the attacker can't even see the locks, can't see the information, can't see the signals, and therefore, the ability to uh, to pick the locks is now gone. How can you pick a lock if you if you can't even see it? So that's the goal, and I, I I'm the reason I'm so excited about physical layer security is 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 not that you know three wasn't enough. Let's go for four. But rather that let's let's close the entrance to the uh, to the attacker altogether. Um, now there's some hope uh, that well if we have narrow beams, did we just uh, completely um, thwart eavesdropping? And so uh, you know, the vulnerability for eavesdropping in wireless is the broadcast. So if I send out a message in all directions, then the eavesdropper will also hear the message, right? But so there was some optimism at 60 gigahertz. These are actual quotes. I won't name names because I'll, I'll show they're not correct. Uh, but the, the, the hope was that at 60 gigahertz, it'll be covert. So you don't overshoot uh, the receiver um, or that the narrow beams will provide security because only Alice and Bob, only Bob can hear the beam that Alice <clears throat> transmits and Eve is too far away. So she's not going to get it. Um, so uh, securing a highly directional link. So suppose Alice and Bob have a highly directional link and I want you to think about two scenarios, wireless LAN and rooftop. So the, the wireless LAN scenario is there's an access point, Bob's got a laptop or a device, we have a narrow beam. Are they immune from eavesdropping in a man in the middle attack? And what I'll convince you of is they're not. And um, the reason they're not is a strong adversary can now manipulate the electromagnetic waves through uh, meta surfaces. And so uh, I'll call this the meta surface in the middle attack in which an adversary, Eve, uh, places a meta surface between Alice and Bob and um, uses the meta surface to allow, allow Alice and Bob to keep communicating. So if Alice just, or if Eve just puts a big radio there and blocks it, well, then the, the Alice Bob link is gone and then uh, they'll stop communicating. Um, so uh, Eve wants Alice and Bob to be able to keep communicating, yet, uh, yet intercept and diffract some of the signal away towards herself. So can she do this? So some of the research questions, can Eve design a meta surface? It's got to be a transmissive meta surface to allow the signal through to Bob. Um, what does she use for meta atoms? Uh, how does she arrange them? How does she build the surface? 
And all of this, we had a paper recently at YSEC and, and some ongoing work as well um, that I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, at the end. So how does this work? So if Eve wants to design a meta surface uh, for purposes of eavesdropping, then she's going to target an angle theta towards herself. So she'll put the meta surface for, for ease of uh, discussion. She'll put a broadside between Alice and Bob. And she's got an angle theta where she's hiding. So she's hiding theta degrees away from, from Bob. And she's going to choose a theta, you know, not too small. She'll get caught. So she doesn't want theta to be a couple degrees. She wants a, a larger angle for herself to be away. So the way she'll design the surface is um, an anomalous diffraction uh, via generalized Snell's law. And so um, I highlighted the part of Snell's law that's for generalized Snell's law. The, the without the yellow part is, is what you probably remember from high school physics. And you'd say, well, we, we've got some index of refraction for the two mediums and an ingoing and an outgoing angle. And you'd probably think, well, that's not going to help us at all. The two mediums are air and we've got broadside incidents anyway. And indeed, yeah, that part is, is actually not, that's not at all what Eve can use. But with generalized Snell's law, if she puts a phase gradient on the surface, and that's uh, phi x is the phase impact that she'll have at the surface, and she can't just have a constant phase impact. If she just delays the whole signal by you know, 30 degrees, it just goes right through a little delay. So she's got to actually change the phase profile in order to um, uh, diffract it away. And so that's the d phi dx. And then C speed of light and F is the carrier frequency. So that, that's Eve's goal. And so the way to think about this is if you like a material analogy uh, with the original uh, Snell's law, you can think of, 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 of a lens, for example, and having the shape of the lens to, to, uh, um, to uh, impact the, 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 the phase of the wave and, and re-steer it or focus it, for example, in the case of, of other lenses. Um, but now we're emulating that with a, uh, with a meta surface. And so we've still got to control the phase. So how do you control the phase? So we'll have a, um, a split ring resonator uh, atom design. And what this is, it's a, a sub wavelength metallic structure. And it's got a few parameters of interest, the, the radius, the opening angle, and the orientation angle. And the great thing about this is by changing the, uh, these three parameters, we change the phase. And so we've got to change the phase across the surface. And so now we can select whatever phase we want on the surface and, and therefore steer the beam. So for example, let's suppose you're, um, you're designing a particular atom in the surface and you say, I, I'd like a, a, uh, a phase shift of let's call it 50 degrees, which is dark blue in the lower right. Then you'd be looking at a radius and on the, uh, if, if you wanted a phase of this color, then you'd be looking up in this region. You say, okay, my radius should be about this, and my split angle should be about 136. So you made a radius of, of uh, 250 uh, micrometers and, and, and a split angle of about 120. And that would get you the, the, the phase that you wanted. And you don't just want to repeat that atom over and over. You actually want a distribution of atoms. So showing here what Eve is going to do. So Eve now has a desired theta. Um, and she's going to choose a phase gradient to yield the desired theta. So the way she does this is um, uh, she's going to choose different atoms, and we'll arrange these in columns. So we say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, atoms, uh, all arranged in columns, and then that'll repeat over and over for the entire surface because um, we've got to have the same d phi dx over the entire surface. So that's going to be 2 pi over gamma. So gamma is a distance here. And that's going to give us the theta. So I'm showing here a spatial period of eight meta atoms over six millimeters. And these are the actual ones that we're going to use in our experiment. And, and these, are, these are experimental results of the surface. And so what you can see is in red, Eve did get a successful 2 pi uh, um, uh, uh, distribution across these eight atoms. And so that means she's got a d phi dx of uh, two pi over gamma. So she successfully had an angle. I'll, I'll show you in the next slide what her theta is going to be. Um, I didn't mention um, amplitude. She would actually like this blue to be flat. Um, it's, it's experimentally obviously not flat. And we'll see how much that affects her ability um, to, uh, to get a good signal at, at her location. 
Okay, so now how do we implement these? So um, there's some different ways to implement uh, meta surfaces and the traditional method is photolithography, which is, is wonderful and high resolution, but um, relatively high cost and, and, and slow. And so the method that we used in, in this work is a rapid and inexpensive uh, fabrication. So it's a printing method, or in essence, printing meta surfaces um, uh, with, with hot stamping. And so the reference on how to do this is below. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful method where you print the pattern on, on paper. So paper is transmissive at these frequencies. So that's our transmissive substrate. And uh, paper, uh, print it using regular laser printer. Um, and then feed a metal foil and the printed paper through a laminator. And what that does is the, the heat and the pressure bond the metallic powder of of the metal uh, foil with the toner uh, from the laser printer. And once those bond, then you end up with a, a, a meta surface, a printed meta surface, a metallic printed meta surface uh, shown on the right. So it's a wonderful technique for rapidly creating um, uh, meta surfaces. Um, so we, we built that, uh, uh, we implemented a meta surface. And so here I'll show you an example experiment and um, uh, and so this is a, a tabletop setup. So um, one thing we don't have here is high transmit power. So we've got a, a less than a microwatt over the entire terahertz. So by having such low power, we are limited to tabletop uh, scales. Um, we do have other platforms I'll show you in a moment for longer distance links, uh, but this one is limited to tabletop due to the low transmit power. Um, so Eve prototypes a hot stamp metasurface in the middle. Um, her target center frequency is 150 gigahertz, and she she targeted 22 degrees. And Bob is broadside to the metasurface. Um, so let's see how well this works. So first of all, let's put Eve 22 degrees away from Bob and see without the metasurface what she's getting. And this is showing what she's getting, and the answer is she is getting noise, and so she can't hear anything. And now we place the meta surface, and she has 20 to 40 dB gain uh, over uh, a range of about 100 gigahertz. Remember, her goal was 150 gigahertz center frequency, and now she's got 20 plus uh, dB gain boost uh, centered around there. So Eve, we will call successful um, uh, at this um, angle that she's targeted of 22 degrees. But now we can ask the question about, well, what did Bob get? Because if, if she blocked the link for Bob, then Bob is going to discover it, um, or that, that, that something is, is going on. And, uh, or if it's, if let's just say there's some big resonance, if there's some big dip somewhere, then Bob's gonna see, oh, this is the signature in the, of an attacker and I won't use it. So this is the link without the meta surface in the middle. And then, when we put the meta surface in the middle there at Bob, Bob is um, surprisingly to us only impacted by uh, several dB. So, um, so the impact was relatively minor, and this would this several dB is uh, you know on the order of what one would expect with with really modest changes in the link. It's not a that's not considered a very large change. So that would be very hard for Bob to um, uh, to discover. Um, I mentioned too that there's a possibility of rooftop links, and uh, and so we're exploring the ability of drones to intercept uh, rooftop links right now. So we've already done it in the lab. So um, this is at Joseph Dronet's lab at Northeastern, and um, and we'll be doing a roof rooftop link there. And so there's a uh, drone, off-the-shelf drone. Uh, the drone is carrying a meta surface, which is just a sheet of paper, not very, not very uh, heavy, uh, printed with uh, some of those metallic uh, split ring resonators. And then there's Bob and uh, Bob and Eve. So the, the lab was successful, and the um, the rooftop is is coming soon. Now, if, if, if you know, one question is, can we do this dynamically? Uh, can you dynamically change a meta surface? So what if Eve needs to move um, or for other purposes, um, can you dynamically do it? 
And so there's some recent work that's not by me. This is again, Kashik Singh Gupta's group at, at Princeton about how to create a dynamic split ring resonator. So what you really wanna do is just, remember I say you wanna open and close it and, and rotate it. And so how do you do that? And so that was by uh, using electronic uh, actuation of, of a ring with some, um, uh, the ability to connect or disconnect different segments of the ring. So you, you digitally and dynamically control to, to short or open portions of the ring and that in effect changes the uh, uh, the radius and orientation angle. So this was some work, again, he implemented it in CMOS around 300 gigahertz and uh, and the uh, the results were, were extremely impressive and uh, he even demonstrated some uh, uh, holography at those frequencies. So we, we need a much simpler uh, 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 capability for, for the meta service in the middle but of course, with solely diffraction, but of course you can use these, once you have complete control of phase and gain, now you can use these to, to uh, realize much more uh, sophisticated waveforms. Um, so the security takeaway is the high frequencies and high directivity provide new capabilities, uh, but also there are new threats. And, um, and so the metasurface in the middle attack uh, is, is, is a way of thinking about what are some of the new vulnerabilities we have, even with highly directional links. There's lots of open research questions. Programming the metasurface in the middle, as I mentioned previously, counter mechanisms, how can Alice and Bob um, uh, do better to try to detect uh, uh, devices uh, in, in their environment, uh, counter counter strategies, uh, actively securing links with the meta service that, that's that right now we consider what if Eve has the meta service, but of course we can give, give a meta service to Alice and Bob as well, and that will, will uh, help them. So um, just a couple concluding remarks, and then I'll be happy to take questions. Um, uh, some of the open challenges, <clears throat> uh, the components, so the circuits and, and uh, making them low cost, programmable, energy efficient, um, sensing, I, I showed an example of sensing and where is the metal rod, right? But we'd like to sense a lot more in, in, our, in our environment. And the thing I'd like to point out is uh, at higher frequencies and trying to do sensing from an H matrix, I think it's just very natural to go straight to a black box uh, learning model. But here we've got a really nice physical model as a starting point. So I think that this will really be a new way of looking at sensing. Um, third, uh, we're not going to throw away below six gigahertz. It, that that is, we need those frequencies too. <clears throat> so they'll all be fused in, in in the future. And how to best do that? Uh, network optimization and management to harness meta surfaces. That these these are coming. Um, I showed one very specific example of using them, but there's many much other work too about using them to increase capacity and get around blockages and so on. So that's a, a challenge moving forward. Um, and then new security threats uh, and, and capabilities. So um, I'll, 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 I'll leave it here with, uh, you know, just to remind you about the, the we've got wide bandwidth, uh, directional links, new devices, and, and, uh, and, and new security. And I'll just end with some acknowledgements. Um, the, the PhD students alumni at my group webpage uh, and the papers that I mentioned that we wrote are all there. Um, collaborators, um, Dan Middleman at Brown University, uh, Joseph Jornet, uh, who is Ian's uh, former PhD student at uh, Northeastern University, and Kaushik Sengupta at, uh, at, at Princeton. And, and I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors too, uh, ARL, NSF, Cisco, and Intel. With that, thank you very much. I'll be very happy to take your questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Edward. And uh, is there any question from the audience? Please uh, type here in the QA section. Uh, I hope we can get some questions. In the meantime, I can start to ask uh, Edward uh, because there is nothing now so far. It looks like everything is clearly explained. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I would uh, uh, focus more on the second part on your. Uh, Meta surfaces, as you know, uh, meta surfaces or intelligent surfaces or reconfigurable intelligent surfaces are beaten to death the last, uh, say, six years. 
And uh, we did research almost 10 years with the uh, uh, European community. Uh, it's called Wiser Surf Project with uh, 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 Crete Fourth Research Center leading it. We work like four or five years. And there are zillions of papers in that wisersurf.eu. So, uh, and then there are many hundreds of other papers. Right? So it looks like you are trying to introduce these meta surfaces as eavesdropper, kind of like uh, you know, denial of service attackers or whatever. Uh, so my, my question is kind of like you're getting it from another perspective. Uh, I mean, these meta surfaces are helping actually to avoid security breaches. You know, we showed it and others showed also that when you design meta surfaces, you can uh, uh, take care of the security attacks. And now you are doing the other way around that you say meta surfaces can help you to do security attacks. So is it uh, straightforward? So I, I don't get the point here. Yeah, I, um, for sure that um, that meta surfaces can be used to uh, to help secure a network. Um, the 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 reason that we're exploring this direction is we always want to consider the strongest possible adversary, and so a strong adversary as we introduce new technologies uh, on on our side. You know, when Alice and Bob say, let's use meta surfaces, um, we, we have to also consider that the adversary will have one. So I, I, I would say it's, it's a consideration of the next generation strong, stronger threat when that threat uh, is equipped with all of these uh, uh, advances that you mentioned, um, because it is a highly active field and there are many meta surface designs. And so we have to think adversaries will also be using those advances. So you are, but the issue is the following. So if the meta surfaces are deployed between Bob and Alice, and then you say Eve can come and deploy her own meta surface and try to do eavesdropping, yep. but then those meta surfaces there between Bob and Alice are not strong enough because they cannot avoid the security breaches, right? So, uh, and then also, where will you place the Eve's uh, 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 meta surface? That's also an important subject, you know, like how will you try to get that information, right? But maybe you're still continuing the research. There are other problems, I mean, questions, uh, uh, Edward. Let me uh, uh, read them to you. Saber Kamoshi is asking, do you see any future for over 60 gigahertz and terahertz to compete with, uh, come on. <laughs> Anyhow, I have to read, with existing under six gigahertz for indoor coverage, I mean solving indoor ultra dense networks. I'll let you answer it. Okay. Um, so I, I'll answer this one and I'll also just one last comment Ian, about knowing where Alice and Bob are in, in, in the scenario. So for sure, Eve has to localize them. I think that the scenario where that's the biggest threat is um, a rooftop backhaul, because then it's very easy for Eve to know where the transmitter and receiver are because they are, they are highly visible and they're non-mobile. Um, I think in the mobile case, then Eve for sure has her hands full uh, she can easily localize the access point, but um, but then she would have to also localize Bob uh, and then place the device. Uh, it would be kind of like putting a bug, right? If, if there's an audio bug and somebody wants a bug, put an audio bug in your office, right? Then they would have to, you know, get it get it in the right spot. Um, so she, for sure, challenges there. Um, but back to the wireless LAN question, um, for. Uh, we, we, I had the bullet about jointly using different frequencies um, uh, for a, a really specific reason that we've always got to have the sub six gigahertz for coverage because we can't have a link outage. You know, if, if you close the door to your office and the access point is out, outside the office and, and, and it can't penetrate through, um, through the door, for example. So we will always have both. I think the way that it's the, the IC Wi-Fi using higher frequencies is through 
the um, the the type of multi-link operation that's that's just now being standardized, and and also the, the channel aggregation, and so on, where there's going to be a base channel below six gigahertz that keeps you always connected, and then opportunistically, that if there's also a two gigahertz, sixty gigahertz, uh, two gigahertz channel at sixty gigahertz or higher to to terahertz, then those will be used for performance uh, enhancements, but you'll always remain uh, connected at lower frequencies. That, that's that's the way I would see industry in evolving um, over, say, say with Wi-Fi 8, that, that, that would be my crystal ball prediction for Wi-Fi 8. And uh, there is one more talk, but here's a comment. Uh, you also mentioned, uh, actually, I remember you were working on super Wi-Fi, I remember like 10, 15 years ago. And then it died down, right? Because it's supposed to do like these uh, uh, secondary uses of TV bands, like super Wi-Fi, but it never made it, right? I mean, are, are, are you following it still? What's going on there? Are they having some businesses in super Wi-Fi? Yeah, so the, uh, the, 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 the challenge with super Wi-Fi uh, has to me has always been the the U.S. lack of channel availability in urban areas, and the um, the the very difficult business case in rural areas. So if you're a startup saying I'm going to ignore all the urban areas and only serve uh, rural, then that's that's a that's a much more challenging uh, environment to work on. Nonetheless, it is still a, uh, a, a rural broadband uh, technology. It, it's, uh, but, but the market, because it's rural, that puts a big cap on you know, where those markets will be. So that, that's, that's why you know, you're not hearing about it every day as the next big 6G thing because it can't, it, it, it's, it's a rural, largely rural only, at least in the US because we have so many TV channels. Let me add something, my personal experience uh, last or before the pandemic, uh, Georgia State called me, and uh, I was really surprised. Even in Georgia, we have rural areas. Believe it or not, we do not have any coverage. The only coverage they have is through the cellular technology. Really, you, you cannot believe that, and it's really expensive, right, to get internet services through the uh, cellular phones. And they were discussing. What can they do to you know provide the services to these rural areas? And then they made, you know, we discussed in a lot of things. And then they said, you know, maybe it will be too expensive for the state to go to those rural areas and provide services. And there will be no company to provide services. So they are really like chicken egg problem. They are stuck. You know, I feel sorry. This is a US even, you know, we are not talking about other countries. So anyhow, if we don't want to have like dialogue here, let's go to the Next question by Hong Ji Guo. And uh, uh, for the meta atoms, will the CMOS switches create nonlinear effects at terahertz? It seems not trivial to add these CMOS switches. What are the challenges in the implementation? Uh, so for sure, it's it's not trivial. Um, and, and, you know, this is... Uh, Kaushik Sengupta's you know, claim to fame is how do you build CMOS uh, uh, meta atoms that are switchable, uh, not only just switchable at all, but switchable at frequencies sufficiently high to be valuable for uh, communication. So I, I won't attempt to say what, uh, what the, the, the CMOS uh, circuit design challenges are because that's so far out of my uh, my area of expertise, but I, I would um, let's see if if I can put that slide back up because I, I would suggest to uh, uh, to look at that slide um, or that paper. There it is, uh, Nature Electronics and um, and and the the design specs and the design challenges uh, are are all in that paper. Okay, are there any questions? I think that's about it. Or so I don't want to take more time of yours. Or uh, one more question, maybe uh, while I'm asking you, uh, some others may get in. 
for these leaky wave antennas in the first part of your talk uh, about the performance. You know, in the higher frequency bands, we have the distance problem. So uh, can your antenna design help to combat the uh, distance problem? How far can you go? I, I assume, are you still indoors, right? And how far can you go? Yeah, so for sure, we're still indoors. And we um, we are just now um, starting to do some, some longer links. So far, we've relied on our collaborators, such as uh, Joseph Jornet for the, for the longer links. Um, and, and those are typically, uh, in, in the experiments, um, non-steerable links. So that still is something we have to experiment with about the longer distance um, steerable links with leaky wave antennas. So it's ongoing work as we move from the, the, you know, the, the tabletop where we're low power and we have a lot of control, a lot of capabilities to, to experiment with new antenna designs. Um, but then as we go to the longer distances and longer range, um, there's some new challenges. We do not have, uh, for example, steerable phase arrays uh, at these uh, higher frequencies uh, currently. Okay, thank you, Edward. And there are no more questions. Alessia, I would like to ask you uh, to get in and uh, go to your wisdom corner questions. Thanks a lot again, Edward. Okay, very thanks nice. again, thank Ian. Appreciate it. appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ian, for moderating this quest, uh, this uh, session or Q and A, and uh, thank you to the speaker for your very informative and comprehensive presentation. So now we move to the uh, wisdom corner, live life lessons, which is based upon the idea to give uh, a unique, and special angle to this webinar series, adding a personal touch. So um, uh, we, we have, during the, the Wisdom Corner, we have uh, successful researchers like uh, Professor Magli today to guide young students uh, in the current uh, ICT research field. So I would start with, uh, with my first question. I have a couple. Um, so which strengths uh, you believe and which uh, capabilities uh, students and young scholars uh, should be most focused on developing and how do you think they could accomplish in, uh, this? Um, well, I would say um, for, for future uh, network design, uh, interdisciplinary knowledge and collaboration is extremely helpful, and um, and so we we as uh, you know, systems researchers, we experimentalists, we build build systems. And in the past, it might have been possible to do it all within your lab without an interdisciplinary uh, collaborator. And and in fact, some of our older projects we did; they were solely. Uh, myself, postdocs, my own students. Um, but I'm finding that that's changing, especially as we get to uh, higher frequencies. And, um, and so I th think that the examples I gave in my talk, uh, including uh, Kaushik Singh Gupta, who's a circuits expert, uh, Joseph Jornet, who, who's more on the communication side, Dan Middleman is a physicist. And, and you know, they, they bring new knowledge that, um, uh, and expertise that, that I don't have in my group. And so I would say the advice is, is, is to uh, learn to work with other disciplines, uh, learn to learn enough about their areas so that you can effectively communicate and collaborate with them. Because in some cases you might find there seems to be a, a little bit of a, uh, a language barrier in terms of the tech lingo that, that, uh, uh, that we use and how we communicate, um, but it's, it's super valuable. And I would say related to that too is, is making sure you learn enough about their areas that you don't just delegate and say, okay, you're the physicist. I'm not gonna learn anything about how these you know, meta atoms really work. You, know, you just get them working and then I'll make a network out of it, but to learn enough about what their capabilities and limitations are so that we can um, uh, co-design. Co uh, what uh, what they what they might achieve. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, let's go more into the some technical details. In which fields specifically, and uh, which topics uh, you would recommend uh, uh, young students to to study? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm an experimentalist. So when I get excited about an area, it's something that maybe uh, is is uh, emerging as a new um, uh, as a new capability experimentally. And so, like for example, Ian mentioned before about how meta surfaces have been a, an active topic for uh, for a long time, and um, and. Uh, and, and that's that's definitely true, but it's also true that we're just now starting to see the capabilities of of um, like the circuit the CMOS circuit that I just showed you, where those are just now getting to the point where they could be viable in in a in a larger system in a operational system, and so that time where you see the cusp of this is this is right before we could really start to put it into standards and and, um, uh, and working products i find the most exciting so that's why i would say in terms of topics um in in the what i had in, in, in the title of my talk is in the sensing and communication and and uh, networking and security all at these higher frequencies because i think we'll we will see new devices like the leaky wave antenna, I, this is, I think, another great example where it's a device that just forces you to change the way you think about networking, that rather than adapt our current methods and you know, tweak a few things to make them go faster, but to maybe rethink about how we perform some basic uh, uh, basic functions in the network. All right. Well, thank you. And let's go maybe with the last question into some more personal uh, anecdotes. Uh, tell us one of the... Uh, of the most tangible contributions that um, had had a strong impact on your life, on others' life, that you are most proud of. Yeah, that I, I would have to point to the technology for all network that Ian mentioned during the introduction that when he visited in in two thousand seven, and and I took him to to see the network. But what what that was is um, as as the name suggests, technology for all. It was it was a network uh, for an underserved community in Houston, and um, and you know the, the story of that was in uh, briefly the short version is in in uh, 2003 we had a large grant from NSF to design next generation wireless systems, we made the front page of the Houston Chronicle, and um, the founder of the organization Technology for All uh, read about our project, and and he he contacted me, reached out to me, and said that we we have this neighborhood where we have a program to give uh, PCs donated by industry to low income communities, uh, but then once and we train them, so this this technology and training, so learning to use uh, PCs, um, and then the then they're stuck because then they can't get. Uh, internet access and then without internet access all that training and the use of the pc is just not valuable and they can't do it because they couldn't afford internet and so he asked he, he challenged me can you take the wireless technology you're developing and 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 uh, give it a trial in this uh, neighborhood and and I'm an experimentalist, but there's a big difference between being a lab experimentalist and being an in the field operational network experimentalist. So it was a massive, massive challenge. That was about the time I just got tenure. So I thought, okay, this is this is this is the time to take on such big, uh, big, big, risky, very high risk uh, project. So we built a completely custom uh, mesh network, and so. Um, uh, meshes when Wi-Fi access points multi-hop uh, amongst each other, uh, and we blanketed the neighborhood with um, uh, with uh, multiple mesh access points and Wi-Fi coverage, and provided free Wi-Fi internet to the uh, to the neighborhood with our custom nodes because there were no commercial nodes at the time. Um, and then uh, since then, a whole commercial industry has has emerged. And, and it's the technology standardized and commercialized uh, mesh is a multi-billion dollar industry today that um, it, it, from homes to outdoor areas use the multi-hopping technology. Um, but so today it's still running. It's, a, it's, it's an operational network using, um, using commercial mesh today. But, the, but you know, back to your question about, that was the first time that we were really meeting and interacting with the end users of the technology. 
So, you know, for example, the things I was presented today, you know, there's so many uh, different things between me and the ultimate user of these technologies has first got to be standardized, commercialized, and then maybe down the line there'll be users. And this was, we, we built it, we designed it, we wrote the software, built the hardware, and, and literally put it in people's homes. So we met the people and said, you know, Here, here's a device, and this should give you free internet. And they were super thankful, super happy. They would call us when it stopped working, right? Because we would have outages and we would get phone calls and so on. So it was really a very unique uh, experience, but also rewarding because we got to see the impact of the research directly and immediately and, and, and meet the people. So that was a really valuable experience. Wow, very interesting. Thank you. This really answers my, my question. A very strong impact when you see uh, that the impact on people, uh, that's, that's, I think, the most um, you're grateful for. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I don't know, Ian, if you would like uh, to ask uh, some questions to our speaker or we, uh, we conclude this session. I think uh, we are done. And I would like to thank Edward again for accepting our invitation and delivering this outstanding talk. And uh, I hope to see you, Edward, in person someday in uh, 2023 hopefully no, no other pandemic will show up right and uh thank you alessia for well, thank you so much thank you both partner. and uh, i uh, i ask uh, uh, the audience please submit your papers to our journal and moreover soon we will have another uh, great speaker uh, our webinar will continue we have like three more lined up so we look forward to seeing you in the next webinar Again, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Edward. And latest, I assume that we'll see you in Istanbul for BalkanCom, right? Sounds yeah. great. Yeah, looking forward to travel. Yeah, travel opening back yeah. up. Absolutely. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. 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 -bye.